Hello, everyone. Good morning, good afternoon, or good evening, depending on where you're joining us from in the world today. Uh, we appreciate your presence here for our presentation, Behind Frenemy Lines, Leveraging Business Relationships in Competitive Industries, presented by Professor Sandy Jatt of Emory University's Goizueta Business School in collaboration with Ivy Exec. My name is Nia Ben Central. I'm the Senior Content Manager here with Ivy Exec. And I'll be helping to moderate today's session. Before we begin, I do have a few brief housekeeping items to review with the audience before we get started. First, all attendees are currently in listen-only mode. However, we do encourage you to participate in the session by asking questions to our presenter. You can do so using the question box in the GoToWebinar control panel located either on the left or right-hand side of your screen. We also encourage questions during the presentation and we'll do our best to field some. And there's also a formal Q&A at the end in the last 15 minutes of the presentation. Additionally, we are recording the session today, so you will be able to receive a follow-up email with a replay link uh, in the coming days. And now, I'd like to introduce you to today's presenter, Professor Sandy Jap. Uh, Dr. Sandy Jap is the Sarah Beth Brown Professor of Marketing at Emory University's Goizueta Business School. Her research centers on the development of organizational relationships, go-to-market strategies, and e-procurement. She's won numerous awards for her impact on the field of marketing, and her work has received significant attention from the academic community and the marketplace, including the Wall Street Journal, CFO Magazine, and Harvard Business Review. She's the author of Partnering with the Frenemy and A Field Guide to Channel Management, both of which are go-to-market books for executives. And with that, I'd like to turn things over to Sandy. Hi, everyone. Welcome to our session today. I'm delighted that you're with me. And in good professorial fashion, I'm going to start our time today with a little quiz. So I'm going to ask you, whoops, whoops. I'm going to ask you to take this very brief poll. If you have a minute right in front of you, um, the poll should be opening up. And I want to just ask a very simple and very general question. So we're going to start today by thinking about your firm and the kinds of strategic relationships and close collaborations that your firms have. And I'd like you to indicate whether or not your firm's strategic relationships historically or kind of on average, have these close collaborations generally been successful or unsuccessful? And I'm gonna just pause right there and give you a minute to fill out that poll. All right, the numbers are climbing. I'll leave it open for a few more seconds. Great. In the meantime, let me just say I'm delighted that you're here with us, um, and I am very excited to speak a bit, a bit about how to better manage these close relationships, close collaborations, um, and frenemies with your um, with your current or past or future partnerships. All right, close the poll just now. And uh, here are the results, Sandy. Uh, we have 60% uh, reporting that their relationships have been successful and 40% unsuccessful. Ah, that's great. That's a great split. And um, I will tell you the truth. Empirically, your results are not very different from what a lot of research shows. So let me share with you a little bit of, of um, some of the research on this topic. So in a recent CMO survey, um, CMOs were asked, how good are strategic relationships in collaborations? And across the board, 85% of them would say that partnerships and alliances are essential to business. And so I think that it's hard to disagree and to say that they're not. Most people would agree that they're important. But here's the rub. 43% of them said they had a high failure rate of partnerships. 42% of those respondents indicated that their partnerships were generally under leveraged, under resourced. And 45% of them, it's, it's totally consistent with your, the results right here on this webinar, said oh, that they Sandy, couldn't. Sorry, yes? if I could just jump in briefly. Um, the uh, platform still showing the audience the uh, poll results. Would you mind uh, closing your, your presentation? I'm uh, sorry, stop sharing your screen and start sharing your screen once again so we can have your deck. Oh, okay. So yeah. you want me to stop showing the screen and yes. now I'll show the screen again. See yes, if that works. Is that yes. working better? Yep, 
Yep, we are back in business. Just a slight glitch of the platform. Thank you, everyone, for your uh, patience okay. and forbearance with us. All right, and maybe you can just cue me on the next poll um, if we need to do something like that again. Yep. All right, so we're back. We're back in business here, and consistent with what all of you have said. Um, the survey, the results of this survey said that 43% of them reported a high failure rate of partnerships, 45% consistent with our results cannot maintain a long-term successful relationship. And what's interesting is that 67% admitted that they didn't have formal partnering strategies in place, which tells me that there isn't a lot of thought going into these strategies and these collaborations even before they're being formed. So what's what other research has shown to inform this issue is that a lot of times the relationship failure is not due at all to the quantitative case, like whether or not you were introduced to the right partner, whether or not you, they were qualified to be your partner, but it was really, the failure is more often than not the result of how the partners have chosen to work together. In other words, these are the, what I call squishy factors. These, this is managing the relationship and issues such as that. And so that's what we want to talk about today. Let me begin. Let's see. Here we go. Let's begin with a couple of good examples, um, visible examples. And I just, you know, think about whether or not these examples resonate with your partnerships. So one of my favorite examples of a strategic partnership or important relationship is that between Google and Samsung. I mean, this is an amazing partnership. This is exactly what partnerships ought to do. They expanded the pie of joint benefits for both Google and both Samsung. Now, why did this work? Well, first of all, each party had something that the other desperately needed. So Google desperately needed a manufacturer of mobile phones and Samsung needed a good operating system. And between the two of them, the partners became number one worldwide in cell phone share. And they remain number one to today. In the US, they tied with Apple, which was a remarkable accomplishment. Um, Google's mobile ad revenue was boosted. Apple's dominance was stemmed. Again, the pie between the two partners was expanded in exactly the way you would hope every partnership would. Here's the problem. Here's the downside. The two partners ultimately became what I call frenemies. Frenemies are partners who, um, who have to work together and they aren't really thrilled about that. And why do they become frenemies? Well, on one hand, Google started to worry that Samsung may be getting kind of too big for their britches, maybe claiming um, or might claim a larger share of the pie in the future. Now, Samsung didn't do that. Google just worried that they could. And so what did Google do? Well, like most partners, they went out and they paid $12.5 billion to acquire Motorola in 2012. This was a competitor, a competitive manufacturer to Samsung. And of course, not surprisingly, it completely pissed Samsung off. So what did Samsung do? Again, in line with you know, most partnering behavior, they responded with um, an operating system called Tizen and they developed that. It was an open source operating system, of course, designed to be a direct competitor to Google's operating system. And so this situation persisted for um, a couple of years. They were in the news, it was widely publicized, very acrimonious, and ultimately in 2014, the two companies just, they called a ceasefire. And Samsung agreed that Tizen would be limited to TV sets and Motorola was ultimately sold to Lenovo as a good faith gesture. So this pattern of behavior happens again and again. And it's not just limited to Google and Samsung. When we look at history, we see that there are many partnerships that have followed a similar pattern. So a frenemy 
is a person or group that is friendly towards another because the relationship brings benefits. So these are the partners that often have to stick together, but at the same time, they are harboring feelings of resentment or rivalry. And one of the most famous um, examples of this, and this is one that I teach in, in my classes to students, is the case between Calvin Klein and Warnico, the manufacturer of Calvin Klein jeans. Now, together, Warnico um, took Calvin Klein underwear sales from 55 million at the start of their partnership, and in five years, they grew those sales to 350 million. How many of your partners are going to do that? to your product sales. That was enormous. And of course, that's a lot of underwear that's out there, but they were very successful together. And then they had a falling out. The falling out was very public. They were in court and the newspapers described their falling out as two Siamese twins trying to scratch each other's eyes out. It is not a pretty metaphor, but this is what happens oftentimes between frenemies. Apple and Samsung have been in litigation for over a decade on a lot of their intellectual property rights. I know this because many of my colleagues have been expert witnesses in those trial hearings and have become very wealthy as a result of their frenemization. Northwest and KLM in the 80s. They were one of the first alliances to together really open up the overseas transatlantic routes between the U.S. and Europe. But their alliance, too, became dubbed the alliance in hell by the press, as these two companies could not get along. Oracle and HP, they were great partners until Oracle decided to go out and purchase Sun Microsystems. And these bumps and these bumps happen a lot between very successful partners. Mobileye and Tesla, they parted ways a number of years ago because Tesla tried to make claims of autonomous self-driving capabilities in the car that Mobileye wasn't comfortable with. So they parted ways and then, as we all heard in the news, um, there was the Tesla crash in which an individual was killed. There's also the recent partnership between Walgreens and Theranos. Very visible, very public. It would have been a great coup if it weren't for the fact that Theranos was in fact doctoring their blood test results. Now, you could argue that Walgreens didn't quite do their due diligence and, and maybe they trusted Theranos a little bit too much. But again, you have these same set of ingredients that led to their downfall and their conflict and breakup. When we think of poor Martha, poor, poor Martha. She really didn't understand that when she signed an exclusive contract with Macy's, that she was not allowed to turn around and sell her goods to JC Penney's at the same time, and that's what she did, and that was their falling out. Costco and Amex was a very visible breakup, and Costco is well known for being frenemies with many of its vendors. In the early days, Target and Amazon were very good partners. Together, they grew online sales for Target very quickly and very successfully. And then Target started to realize that Amazon was getting to be too big and too powerful of a partner. And so there are many, many more examples of frenemies in the past. And the reality is that this happens to a lot of relationships. And as research has shown and our own informal poll has shown, it can happen to as much as, as many as 40% of business relationships on average. So let's, let me share with you um, and let's unpack a little bit how these frenemy situations happen. So if we look at and we think about the example of Nike and Foot Locker, Nike designed, of course, and created the whole sneaker craze. Together with Foot Locker, who distributed all those sneakers, they grew the, um, the sneaker pie to basically something around $16 billion together, okay? A very successful partnership they all shared in those pie shares. And then the falling out happened something like this. 
Foot Locker became a little um, unsatisfied and disturbed with some of the rigid selection and pricing terms that it felt like it was getting from Nike. And as a result, what they did is they then slashed their orders to Nike by 15 to 25%. Now that's nothing to sneeze at. And so of course, Nike didn't just sit there and take it. They responded by then dropping their shipments to Foot Locker by 40% and withholding top sellers. And as a result of that, Foot Locker's response was then to drop their prices further in order to boost sales. And as we all know, lower prices basically ruins the brands, ruins brand equity. And so Nike was up in arms in, about it. Now this frontalization right here and the pattern that happens here happens regularly among many firms. And as in most or many frenemy situations, the situation, the relationship between the partner usually just gets worse. In fact, it got so bad that they really never could repair the relationship between the two companies. And this is why we see the emergence of stores like Nike Town and why we see Nike doing all sorts of engaging and the flash sales of their newest products. Um, and going basically direct to consumers because they could never get Foot Locker, they could never incentivize them to give their products the level of service and um, the um, visibility in their stores that Nike wanted. And so top sellers like the self-tying shoes and things like that have never been available in Foot Locker stores. So, the patterns that we're talking about here and the problems that we're talking about here, um, you know, many may not, many executives don't realize that there's actually a lot of research that goes into how to manage these kinds of relationships between organizations. And truth be told, we don't always reveal a lot of that. Um, in the business school. In the business school, we are often more concerned with building and helping you understand the quantitative case, but we all know, anybody in business knows that at least 40% of business is relationships. And I will tell you, and you probably know that if you have an MBA, 40% of your program was not about how to manage relationships. So what I wanna do is share with you a little bit of the science that goes that has been done, not just in marketing, but in economics and organizational theory and in strategy about how relationships devolve, how they evolve, how they perform over time, and really, more importantly, what the implications are for those of us doing business today. So I'm gonna walk through what I like to refer to as kind of the laws of relationship physics. What do we know about how relationships work and what should we do about that now? All right, so it turns out that the path to frenemization often happens like this. And maybe if you think back to those unsuccessful relationships, you might see these patterns as well. In the case of Google and Samsung, what happened is that the partners were highly successful. Success is great, but the more successful you are and the more you expand that pie, the more dependent you are on that particular partner. And no firm likes to be wholly dependent on a particular outside partner. And so what happened? what they often will do is affirm one of those partners will try to kind of counterbalance their dependence. So the more dependent you are, the more you try to counterbalance. So maybe that is like Google, it means let's go out and find another competitive manufacturer to counterbalance our dependence and our reliance on Samsung. And when you do that, the first thing that happens is that all that does is it just raises suspicions and it makes the other partner, Samsung, believe that you've been opportunistic and you're trying to screw them over. And so both partners will get vilified, there are moves, counter moves, and oftentimes that spiral becomes worsened. And so between the two of them, as the um, other partner um, now has to respond, oftentimes with ugly or opportunistic or self-seeking attempts as well, then the whole relationship will, will typically spiral 
out of control. And this pattern is a pattern that we see over and over in terms of frenemization and how these things go awry. So let's talk about what we can do to counteract this. And I'd like to leave you with a set of um, principles that you can take back and start using today. The first principle, <coughs> excuse me, has to do with trust. Now, trust is, of course, essential to any partnership. You can't have a partnership without trust. But the problem with trust is many executives like to think of trust or they think of trust as being like money in a bank. And so they will say, you know, you build every time you um, build trust or create trust, you're depositing money in a bank. And when you need trust, you can kind of pull that out and charge it against your bank account. But there's a problem with that metaphor. And what I'm going to ask you today is to stop thinking about trust like a checking account. Trust, a better metaphor for trust is to think about trust like water in a bathtub. And so here comes our second poll. Our next poll is going to ask you this question, which is, which happens faster in a bathtub? If you think about the rate of water in a bathtub, does it build faster? or does the water drain faster? And I'm just gonna give you 30 seconds to think about that, complete the poll, and Ni is going to jump in and let us know when we have um, a set of um, results. All right, just leave it open for a couple more seconds. Thank you all for your votes. What I typically find is that people who like to take baths will tend to get this answer Correct. <laughs> we'll find out who are our bath fans out there. All right, gonna close the poll uh, right now. I'm not a bath person, so I so I initially I didn't get this right. All right, so here are the results. Uh, 16% say builds faster, and a whopping 84% say drains faster. Good. We've got a bunch of smart people on this call. That's awesome. So the answer, and can you see my screen? Okay, me. Yes, we're all set this time. Okay, good. So the answer is that it drains faster. The water drains faster. And a trust is like water in a bathtub, okay? Think about this. It takes time to build up the level of water in that bathtub to make it really useful, right? Half a bathtub, a quarter of a bathtub filled with water is not really good for anything. So it takes time for those constant inflows of water to build that level up to something that's useful. But trust can be lost in an instant. And that's really the takeaway. And that's not like a bank account. So, and, and here's why. So trust can be lost in an instant. Let me show you on the next slide why that's not even further, why that's not like a bank account. Okay. So think about this. The next principle of relationship physics is this idea that grand gestures make things worse. And let me give you an example that we can all relate to. Imagine that there is a person who loves receiving fresh flowers. And in fact, many women love receiving fresh flowers from their partners. But a lot of times, partners do not like to give fresh flowers. And this, the reason why is because many of them say, well, first of all, you know, those flowers, they're going to die after a couple of days. So basically, after two days, it was a big waste of money. I gave you a gift. And now it's not there anymore. OK, so imagine the woman who um, for many years has um, been with a particular partner and over the years has gotten used to the fact that this partner will never um, give her flowers. And then on Valentine's Day, the partner shows up with a bouquet like the one pictured here. Now, if trust is like a bank account, this woman should be over the moon, right? Because what her partner just did was come along and make a huge deposit in that bank account. But in fact, the woman's reaction is a little bit more like this, okay? And in fact, that great big gesture that that partner just made actually makes the whole relationship 
worse off. And believe it or not, this is an effect that we've documented with thousands of buyers, industrial buyers and suppliers in a range of different industries. So when your business partner who maybe doesn't like to give out price concessions or says, I'm never going to give you a particular territory or I'm never going to do X, Y and Z for you, suddenly comes to the table and says, guess what? We've changed our mind. We're going to do that right? If trust was like a bank account, your bank account has just been full to the max and you should be over the moon. And instead, your response is suspicion. And so it turns out that grand gestures make things worse. It, a better way to both build trust and to improve a relationship is to do smaller and more credible things instead of grand gestures. So back to the partnering example, maybe if the spouse had done something like emptied the dishwasher or made dinner or given his partner a night off or something like that, that might have been more credible and less grand, but that's the way that you both build trust, win back a partner, and you make the relationship better. All right, let's move on to another principle. The third principle of relationship management is that you need to manage your partner's expectations. And I see this over and over as a key reason why many relationships fail. You can do this upfront at the start of a new partnership by investing the time to talk about those expectations. And I'm giving you an example here. This is an example from Cisco. So as um, many of you may already know, in the high tech industry where things are very fast moving, firms are very used to developing partnerships, dissolving partnerships and going on and making new partners. There are a, there's a lot of partnering activity that happens in this particular industry. And Cisco is one of the companies that in my mind is sort of a best practice example of how to do partnering well. And what they do with every new partner that they have is they begin by asking a couple of broad questions. They think about, first of all, how will we resolve conflict between us? So if a conflict arises, and that almost always will, what's going to be a suitable escalation path? How are we going to deal with changes in our assumptions on both parts? Things are moving very quickly in the high tech world. Your strategic priorities can change. Well, you know, what, how we, how and when will we discuss that? Is there even opportunity? Will there be a framework for that discussion? How will we manage long term investments if they're involved? They will ask themselves, what about investing imbalances? Sometimes one partner may put in more than the other. What will happen if something goes awry? How will those investments be recouped? They also ask, importantly, how often are we to stay in touch? Is it weekly? Is it monthly? What's the follow-up protocols? Who should we be talking with? I often say that you need to have a one-up and one-down approach to your partner, which means that you need to have access to the person above and below your point of contact. And by access and responsiveness, what I mean is that if you were to give them a call, would they call you back within 48 hours? That's the kind of access that you need. So Cisco starts every relationship by just thinking about these questions and talking about it with their alliance partner. And many alliances that have failed are have often failed because these things were never dealt with. And I like to tell executives that, you know, the thing is, you can either take the time or, in other words, incur the cost to talk about these things up front in a partnership, or you can wait till the partnership goes bad and deal with it on the back end. You're going to make you're going to make that investment and cost anyway. You choose. I think you're better off um, incurring it up front. OK, principle number four, a bad history poisons today. Now, this is based on some research that I did um, with about 1,200 distributors of a major chemical equipment uh, manufacturer. 
And what we did is we basically looked at this idea of the relationship life cycle. And as and you know, we're all familiar with the idea of products having life cycles, but relationships also have life cycles. So relationship goes through stages where the partners are first exploring the possibility of whether or not it makes sense to work together. And then once they decide, yes, you're a good partner, I trust you, they'll start building up either with joint activities or making investments into the partnership um, to and in that way they're able to then you know grow the pie of benefits which is what everybody wants they reap that for a while and then oftentimes the partnership will end and this life cycle is actually a very healthy thing to do so what we looked at in this research is we looked at basically um, relationships that kind of follow this life cycle and we looked at relationships that didn't follow this life cycle in other words was this life cycle pattern something that that was um, that is good to follow in your relationship practices and the answer is yes so what we saw is that relationships that would develop systematically through a stage of testing the waters then committing um, creating a sense of high-level benefits before exiting we found that the overall performance evaluations of partners and satisfaction with that relationship tended to increase when partners went through that sort of pattern. Now, we also considered the possibility, well, what about those that didn't? When we look at partners that didn't go through that pattern, that maybe did the reverse, so maybe and they went um, from build up to maturity too quickly, um, maybe these partnerships tried to um, repair their par their partnerships. So many partnerships, 12% of the partnerships that were in decline said, well, let's go back and let's try to start over from exploration, or let's try to go back to build up and let's go back to maturity and let's try to re do this rebuild and make our relationship good again. So if you think of Calvin Klein and Warnico um, and some of those other examples, Google and Samsung, the question would be, could they go back and kind of start over again? Um, and it turns out that the results of that research showed that when they did that, the performance evalu evaluations of their partners were systematically lower. Okay, and so this result tells us that the path to here, in other words, your past strongly colors your evaluations of performance today. In other words, it is very difficult to rebuild relationships and to improve and to heal when you've had a bad past. Now, I'll give you a little antidote. In 2016, I was in South Korea and I visited Samsung Strategy Group. And at that time, I asked them about how their partnership with Google was going. Because after all, they had called a ceasefire. They had gone back and tried to improve and rebuild that relationship. I will tell you that the response that I got from the executive was extremely, extremely icy at best. It was a little convoluted, which is what a lot of people do when they don't really want to answer a question very directly um, and when they're trying to skirt an issue. And that's exactly what happened. And it was very clear that those wounds had not healed. So it's difficult to be, rebuild relationships when you've had a bad history. So now, Here's our next very short quiz or poll question today. Given what we know about relationships and the difficulty, both the ease with which trust is lost, the time that it takes to build trust and the impact of a bad history, many executives have asked me, um, well, Sandy, is there a golden bullet like, if I can only remember one thing to take away in terms of partnership management, what would that one thing be? And so the poll is now open for you to indicate which of the following aspects of relationships do you think is the most important ingredient 
in a strategic relationship or a close collaboration with a partner you might have. All of these options are options which have been explored by a lot of research in the past. Some research say a good con contract. Some say, well, you got to have mutual goals. Others say you have to have trust. Others say, well, both parties have to have some sort of investments. And others will say, well, they both need to be committed to making this work. So take a minute and indicate which of those you think is the most important ingredient. A lot of these are very necessary for close collaborations, but there's only one that is actually pretty sufficient in making sure that your relationship works. All right, the polls been open actually a little bit over a minute, so I'm going to bring it to close now. We've got a good, it uh, seems like we're steadying in terms of the, uh, the, the incoming votes. All right, Great. close now. All right, and here are the results, Sandy. Uh, we have 5% saying A, a good contract, 8% saying B, joint goals, 70% uh, saying C, uh, trust, 3% uh, saying D, mutual investments, and finally 13% saying E, commitment. Wow. So there's a lot of there's a, a lot of people saying trust is important. I will tell you, you know, that that's a really that's a good response. Um, trust is definitely a necessary ingredient for relationships to work. I will tell you that research shows, though, that trust is not a sufficient condition. It's important, but it's not going to save the day. In fact, the thing that will save the day is actually the one that less than 10% of you um, chose, and that's mutual investments. So mutual investments have both, in, have, um, there's been a lot of empirical evidence that shows this is actually the best aspect of the relationship to both safeguard um, your relationship, to guard that expanded pie, and to make it work into the future. So let's talk about first, what do we mean by mutual investments? What we mean by our dedicated um, matching investments from both players. Examples of this might be capital equipment, dedicated capital equipment, warehouses, facilities. It might mean that you've got people who are specifically dedicated to working with a particular partner. Maybe the two organizations develop specific um, processes or strategies. Maybe it's you know the flow of products through distribution warehouses. Maybe it's some kind of proprietary technology for your sales force. There are specific learnings there, and they work together in such a way that um, it helps leverage uh, the the both parties um, in the partnerships. So let me give you an example. Oh, first. Let me just tell you that it's very important that these investments be what economists call non-fungible. And what that means is that you can't easily just take that investment out and redeploy it with another partner. So money is not a good matching, dedicated matching investment because you can easily liquidate that and put it back, put it to work with another partner. In the auto industry, there are a number of auto manufacturers who are working with 3D printing companies to develop products and components that are specifically optimized to a particular car model or to a particular manufacturer and its processes. That's what I mean by a dedicated matching and non-fungible investment. It's a risk that's tied specifically to a particular partner. You can't just take it out and redeploy it elsewhere. Now, this idea of mutual investments are really what economists have called credible commitments, or they often refer these to these as a tying of the hands. So you're kind of, both partners are bound to each other. That's the purpose of these investments. And unlike trust, it's these investments aren't easily broken. And the reason why these work so well is because these investments cause both partners to number one, not walk away prematurely until the investments, um, the value of the investments are recouped. And number two, it creates such risks that both partners are incented to work for the mutual good instead of pursuing their own ends. And um, we like to call these kind of aligned incentives. So mutual investments are the 
in a long-term strategic partnership, okay, these are important relationships, they are the most effective way to safeguard that relationship, keep it on track, make sure you get the benefits and um, the returns that you want, and ensure um, that your partner is not screwing you over in that relationship. Okay, so let's move on. I've got another principle for you. So on one hand, I had said earlier that a bad history is hard to overcome. And that means then that if you can't repair a bad history, you're better moving on. But moving on is something that is hard to do. And many um, companies have a hard time with saying no or saying goodbye to their partner. And so I like to tell companies that whenever you can, you need to be comfortable with saying goodbye. Now, this process of saying goodbye, um, it reminds me of a book. There's a book um, several decades ago. I'm going to show my age here. It was by Dale Carnegie. It was called How to Lose Friends with that, How to Lose Friends and Influence People. And I like to say that the process of saying goodbye to your partner is a lot like how to lose friends without influencing people. So we need to be comfortable with saying goodbye. And there are actually templates for how you can say goodbye to a partner. So again, going back to Cisco as a best practice company, when Cisco said goodbye to its key partner, Ericsson, it went through a process that looked something like this. First of all, it asked itself, what are the disadvantages or the advantages of terminating? this relationship and then they approached Ericsson and um, together the two of them decided to um, end their partnership but they both committed to the fact that mutual customers should not experience a service break or failure as a result of this of course both companies would hurt their reputation their brand equity would be impacted if that had happened so the two of them put their heads together to problem solve what should we do about mutual customers they then thoroughly communicated the rationale um, at different levels of both firms. They together came up with alternatives and they communicated those alternatives to those that were impacted in both firms. And then together, one by one, they tactically worked together, sometimes on a case by case basis to make sure that no customer was negatively impacted. So this is just one example of how we can get better at saying goodbye without it having to be painful. I will just give you one editorial comment here. I often hear executives talk about their partners, strategic partners or alliances, um, alliance partners as being married partners. And they like to talk about how their partnership was a marriage to a particular firm or organization. And I would like to encourage you to please drop the marriage metaphor. Marriage metaphor is completely inappropriate for business relationships because number one, if you think of the marriage metaphor, oftentimes it implies that two partners are together for life and no business partnership is a commitment to stay together until one or both firms die. Um, the other problem with a marriage metaphor is that marriage um, often implies that the partners um, are, um, are, are uh, what is it called, mutually exclusive, right? That they don't consider alternative partners. And in fact, um, in business, you should always be considering alternative partners. And then finally, the problem with the marriage metaphor is that when it comes to saying goodbye to a business partner, it, then that the goodbye becomes like a divorce. And most people consider divorce to be a negative process and they don't want to engage in that. But if saying goodbye 
um, is more like saying goodbye in a dating relationship. I think a dating relationship is a better metaphor for business relationships than the marriage relationship. Most dating relationships, they come together for a period of time and it lasts for as, as long as it's creating value for both partners. And then at some point it ends and both partners oftentimes just go on um, with you know no harm done. And that is the way we need to think thinking about our business relationships. So here's some more thoughts on getting good at saying goodbye to your partner. The first step is to, number one, think it through. Ask yourself, what are the possible end games? Who are the winners and losers if this were to happen? The next thing to think about is think about customers, both internal to your firm and external. How are they gonna be affected? How will you ensure that that change is not detrimental? And then talk it over with your partner. You know, you'd be surprised a lot. If you're thinking about terminating the relationship, the partner is likely thinking about it too. And getting it out in the open may just be a big relief for everyone. And finally, again, importantly, you must part as friends. And the reason why is because most of us work in industries that are small enough that we know each other. And the reality is that the day may come when you might have to hit your wagons up again. And when you part as friends, oftentimes your partner will go and tell other potential future partners of yours that you were a good partner to work with. So you always want to part as friends. Okay, with this, we're on um, the home lap here. I'm gonna just summarize a couple of key um, ideas and principles that we've discussed, and then we're going to open it up for questions. So the first principle, the first law of relationship physics is this idea that trust is more easily lost like water in a bathtub than it is built. Building trust takes time. It happens by regular small gestures over a period of time. The second principle is that grand gestures make things worse. Trust is not like a bank account. You can't just come along, make a big deposit, and expect that everything will be hunky-dory going forwards. It's not. What is needed instead are smaller, regular gestures. And by the way, let me explain for you that a little bit more about that mechanism. What happens is when 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 you have a partner, you kind of expect that partner to operate within a range of behaviors. And when that and and whenever that partner acts in a way that goes beyond that, you're violating a partner's expectations of behavior. And when those expectations are violated, it creates a level of uncertainty that is aversive. And that aversiveness is what drags down and raises suspicions and makes the relationship worse. So smaller regular gestures are the way to build and to improve relationships. Number three, it's important to manage partner expectations up front. A very simple thing to do to improve all your partner relationships and close collaborations is just to have a conversation up front about how the relationship's gonna work. How and when will we, will we communicate? How and when will we handle conflict, changes, and assumptions? The fourth principle to remember is that a bad history poisons today. If you've had a bad history with a partner, if you can move on, you are better off doing that and starting over than trying to rebuild a bad relationship with a current partner. Sometimes you don't have the choice, but if you do, that's the way to go. With good partnering relationships, if you really want to make sure that you both expand the pie of joint benefits for the partner and you want to make sure that your partner doesn't have an incentive to screw you in the process, then you need to both have credible skin in the game through mutual investments. And those mutual investments have to be real risks for each partner. They can't be investments that are easily taken and redeployed elsewhere. Those real stakes will motivate both partners to do what's best for the partnership 
keep their focus on each other until those the value of those investments are recouped. And finally, it's so important that we learn how to lose friends without influencing people. It's important that we get good at saying goodbye because bad histories are hard to overcome. Now, those six principles are just a small sample of um, many, many things that you can do. Um, I've talked about more all of those, the fuller range of options in my book called Partnering with a Frenemy. It's available for sale at Amazon. Um, I hope that this presentation has given you a taste of um, both the what's in the book. Um, the book is a lot about you know how and why um, do relationships break down? What's the research behind that? Um, but more importantly, what, what else can you do to bulletproof and improve your partnerships so that that 40% unsuccessful rate that we saw at the start of this presentation might be reduced significantly. And with that, um, me, I'm going to turn it over to you. Um, do we have questions and how are we on time? Yes, we do. Um, we uh, are uh, good on time. I will try to get to as many questions as we can. If we run a little bit over, uh, you know, that's, that's not an issue. Um, let me start with uh, Yanira. Um, when you were speaking to the, uh, the poll about which ingredients are most necessary for a great relationship, you, of course, revealed that mutual investments uh, were the most important. Uh, you need to like, understand the placement of uh, goals, where that fits in the hierarchy, if, if any such thing exists. Yes, yes. So all of those ingredient, ingredients are very important. That's a great question. Um, and I will tell you that their importance is something like this. So um, at the start of the relationship and the exploration and buildup phase, the contract is very important and um, for kind of safeguarding your interests and your outcomes. Um, goals becomes important oftentimes when conflict arises. In the absence of conflict, um, having mutual goals doesn't really um, do much in terms of making sure your partner is an opportunistic, but they come into play when there's a conflict. Um, and then some of those others, commitment is often, commitment is kind of oftentimes more like an attitude. And that is probably one of the biggest predictors in terms of the, um, the partner's intent to continue in the future. Um, but even so, a lot of these attitude um, factors, so um, commitment, trust, attitudes will wash away um, when the when the um, relationship really takes a dive. So when problems, um, and what I mean by really takes a dive is like when one partner really starts to act opportunistically. So in the face of increased opportunism, those things really don't become that effective at all. But the mutual stakes, having those real credible investments, that is the best safeguard against opportunism um, from your partner. Well, and great. that's true over the course of the life cycle. Okay. Uh, I'm going to uh, give you a two-part question combining questions from Jorge and uh, Mark. Uh, Jorge would like to understand um, at the, uh, at, when it comes to the, the issue of uh, memory, <laughs> um, we realize that it can be difficult for us to forget the past. And so in the case where uh, you're dealing with a partnership where some sort of offense has taken place and you'd like to try and repair a relationship, uh, is there a way to overcome memory, um, whether it's politely ask them to forget or, how, or, or what have you? Uh, how do you move past memory when trying to you know, uh, keep a partnership going? And that's sort of part one at the company level. And then uh, Mark and also Jorge note that some of the principles you're discussing may also apply at the employer-employee level or at the interpersonal level. And if you have any insights or advice uh, on that. Yes, yes. Okay, those are, those are, again, great questions. Man, we have great people on this call, smart and asking good questions. So the, the first, uh, okay, wait, now I've just completely lost. Um, the first part was... First part is at the company oh, yeah, level. Memory. How do you okay. pass memory? <laughs> Speaking of memory, I have none. Yeah, which. <laughs> um, <laughs> okay, uh, so memory. Uh, so the short answer is no. You can't erase memory. Um, and part of that is 
you have, um, and in your second question, you kind of alluded to this, right? So in every firm, you've got the people, and you, so you have personal processes happening, and then on, you know, on top of that, you've got organizations. Organ everything, um, most of what I've told you about is mostly at the organizational level. So organizations can have relationships, they can have trust, organizations have memories. And as long as employees um, continue on at those organizations, those memories persist. OK, so um, and it's because of that, I think, that even though the the individual employees, they leave the firm, it's the organization that remembers. Um, and that's because there are always people left behind. Now, the second part of that, which is, you know, these principles, can they be applied to different kinds of relationships? The answer is yes, absolutely. So these principles of trust and managing expectations, they can absolutely um, they can absolutely generalize to your employee relationships. They can generalize basically to how you work um, with other people within your firm. So for example, you might say like, well, I don't work with a strategic partner. I don't work with an organization outside the firm. Okay, but you work with other organizations and other groupings inside your firm. There are other departments, right? And you're having to manage that relationship too. Of course, you can't switch out, you know, other departments in your firm for new partners, but you can build trust with them. You may have bad history with them. Those things will generally, generally um, apply as well. I've just given you kind of the research at the organizational level, but these things um, will go further than that. All right, that's a great segue to the next question coming up from Rito. Uh, Rito would like to understand, uh, since you mentioned research just now, uh, he's wondering if there are any stats that show whether there's a difference in the frequency of the uh, buildup uh, or the rebuild of frenemies, uh, if that has, if uh, culture has an impact on that. So for example, if, if uh, the partners are the same or, or different backgrounds, does it have an impact on how uh, the, the um, relationship builds up and, and maintains? Yeah, so the short answer is I'm not aware of research that looks specifically at that question. Um, it may be the case that the research hasn't been done, but the, um, but my, um, my sense is that it must absolutely impact. I'm sure that the cultures of the two firms um, have got to impact, you know, the kinds of relationship choices that both partners will make. Um, the cultures, let's say, for partnerships between, you know, a Western company and a Chinese company, absolutely, that's got to impact as well. Um, but I, I can't think of a specific paper that looks at that and. I can't think of a specific paper that might look at that, especially like in the different phases as well, but it has got to impact for sure. Well, maybe he just gave you a new research topic. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. That's All right. another one to put on my plate. For sure. <laughs> I'm sure you don't have enough though. <laughs> um, this next question comes from Abhishek. And Abhishek would like to know if you might have some examples of uh, some very strong uh, partnership uh, joint ventures between two rival companies uh, in an industry where they're able to leverage uh, value through joint venture. So a joint venture, um, first of all, the short answer is yes, there are many examples of that. OK, um, another very short answer is that I can't think of any off the top of my head. Um, but, you know, a joint venture is um, oftentimes different from a collaboration or an alliance in the sense that many joint ventures will start. Um, they are often companies started. Uh, they're started by two companies. Um, who create a third company that's often independent on its own, and the parent companies each kind of have um, an equity or uh, a, a financial stake, you know, at the beginning that kind of determines their shares and how they share the pie of benefits. Um, I think that um, these relationship principles would definitely apply um, among the parent companies as they think to come together. Um, and then once that joint venture that is spawned, that third company that kind of, kind of spins off, um, I think that 
any relationships that that third company then forms with other companies um, and um, maybe the uh, the way the third company works internally i think that these um these principles could also be applied there as well does that answer the question i hope so <laughs> I hope so. Uh, I'll see if we can get a, a quick yay or nay uh, from the uh, that from Abhishek. <laughs> um, so we're uh, about at time. I'll ask one final question. I'll take an editorial license. It's actually my question. Um, you mentioned uh, the second principle about grand gestures not being the way to go, small gestures being the appropriate way to build a relationship. Um, I was wondering if you know if on the back end there might be a protective aspect of that should things go awry. Will my small investments early? Um, help to protect a misstep later on uh, in, in a partnership? Yeah, so those small gestures um, are things that build trust. And, um, and trust is important really, you know, to get the firms to create mutual investments, right? But um, what we showed later on with the question about which of these in terms of the magic bullet, right? Trust um, really won't save the day when things go really bad. So when that partner goes out and so when Samsung uh, goes out and decides to develop Tizen, right? When Google goes out and de decides to acquire Motorola, when those big um, opportunistic actions happen, the trust, the goals, the commitment and good intentions and the way we work, flexibility, none of those things are going to save the day. It's the joint investments that have already been made that will work the best. Okay, okay. fair enough. So trust is not enough. Mutual investments are the best way to go. <laughs> they are the golden bullet. Got it, got it. Sounds good. Abhishek uh, gave a positive thumbs up uh, for your response. So you did okay. answer the question. <laughs> okay, great. So I think that does bring us to the end of today's uh, presentation. Thank you so much, Sandy, for a really thorough, engaging, and informative uh, presentation. I learned a lot. I hope all of our listeners did as well. Uh, we thank you for joining us for this uh, collaboration between Emery Goizueta and Ivy Exec. Hope to see you again in the future. And uh, Sandy, I'll turn it over to you for any final words to the audience. No, thank you. You've been a fantastic audience. I so appreciate your um, involvement in the polls. This is the first time I've, I've built polls into um, the presentation, and I'm really glad I did. So I hope you have a great day. I hope you have taken something away that would be useful, and thank you for joining us. Okay, great. Take care, everyone, and continue to join us here at Ivy Exec because we bring you more great uh, support information to develop your careers 